welcome to the podcast. Um, the guest joining me today needs very little introduction and it, as he is one of the select few, I believe, to get football commentary and the art of communication down to a T. He's worked for the BBC, ITV, notably the voice of the England national team games, and for people around my age, um, although I don't play it as much as I used to, I very distinctly remember yourself and Andy Townsend as the commentators for the international fixtures. So, Clive Tilsey, good morning. How are you? Really good. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yeah. We've um, fortunately, touch wood, um, uh, we're, we're healthy. Yeah, very of that. And I was going to say, this is a, a very strange time to be involved in sports media with the enforced absence of, in our case, football. As someone who's been involved in the sport uh, and seeing it grow over time, how have you found life life without football these last couple of months? Um, well, it's been interesting. Um, I've I, I stayed busy. Um, I, I think I've um, contributed to about um, 153,000 of these. Uh, not obviously all Everton. <laughs> um, I've done a little bit of media mentoring. I've written a book. Um, I, uh, I've started up a little business with the commentary ch mm. charts, uh, which we've done prints of, including the, um, the Bayern Munich semi-final at Goodison in, in 85. Um, yeah, a, a little bit of social media and stuff. So i funny enough, just in the last hour or so, I've been given my first fixture for the, for the restart, which is a week on Saturday for me. Uh, West Ham uh, against Wolves, Moisey, um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean that that sharpened my focus over the the next few days. I've watched a little bit of the Bundesliga just out of interest, really, to try to get a feel as a commentator what it'll be like. Uh, I quite like the artificial crowd sounds um, yeah. that I heard at the, the weekend. I. I, I the whistles when a referee gives a dodgy decision. I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure who's pressing that button. I mean, that's a little bit controversial. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I mean, I think I've been to Goodison three times this season. The uh, to commentate for Talksport, and the position there is. Uh, I mean, I'm six feet one. I can barely climb into it. Um, and there's no monitor to see or anything. You're looking, you know, the, the, there isn't such thing as a non obstructed view anywhere at Goodison Park. It's part of the charm and the beauty of the place. Mm. Um, I was there for Dunk's first game, and, um, uh, you know, I, um, it, it is always a, a sort of a, a special experience. The place does rock and shake when, uh, when, you know, when the team get it going. Um, we're not going to have that for a while, and it's, I don't know. I I don't know how it'll sound. I don't know how it'll look. We're we're going to have to we're going to have to feel our way as broadcasters. You're going to have to feel your way as fans watching on TV. And even when you're allowed into the stadium, I guess you're going to come in in dribs and drabs. So we talk about the executive boxes coming in first, which I'm sure will go down well on Merseyside. Mm. Um, I don't know. I I I, I can't. I can't look you in the camera and say I'm um, absolutely thrilled and this is fantastic and I, you know, really looking forward to it because there's so much uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, even from a professional point of view, um, when we do television, I'm going to have to talk a little bit more just to kind of, you know, give the thing more rhythm and stuff. I'm not, I'm not, hopefully not a commentator who does talk too much. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about the art of communication and the art of communication is recognizing your audience and, and and serving them whether it's radio tv a huge game not such a big game you've got to kind of adapt to that audience and um uh, we're going to have to adapt again here um i think it's all going to feel a bit odd to be honest yeah it will be most definitely and like you say watching the, the bundesliga it, it is like a, an acquired taste but suppose we we have to acclimatize to it to, you know we we love football and um, before moving on to Everton things, uh, a friend asked me this to, to put forward to you. Um, uh, he used some great examples. As a commentator, do you feel, obviously, you had Andy as your, your co-commentator for you know the, the international fixtures and what have you. My mate said, 
like on the field of play, there are great examples of, of partnerships up, up front. He used the example of Suarez and Sturridge. And I think he said, you know, for example, at the back, um, Vidic and Ferdinand. Do you feel like a, a co-commentator, um, when suited up, brings the best out of you? You've got some mate there who, who draws on Liverpool and Manchester United, for example. So no, I think I you need some new friends, if you don't tell mind me, me saying, Max. Tell, tell me about it. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Um, I've had genuine friendships with certainly the vast majority of um, my co-commentators. Um, I, I played golf with Glenn Hoddle yesterday um, uh, and lost to him and Lee Dixon uh, on the last hole <laughs> down then. Um, so, yeah, the pals. Um, Andy is Andy Townsend was very close, very close indeed. I, I think the answer is yes, but um, in terms of when I'm talking to kind of media undergraduates and stuff about communication, I'm a great believer in what I call inclusive broadcasting, which means that you are welcoming everybody in. I think there is a danger if it gets a bit too buddy and a bit too pally and a bit too nickname and nickname uh, and where we were last night and having a meal and all that sort of, that actually you're cutting the audience out. And I think it just gets a bit kind of sports bar chummy. Um, and I don't like that as a rule. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about stilted 1960s BBC commentary. I don't think it should be that either. It should have plenty of warmth. Um, and, and I think, yeah, the relationship, if it is, if there is a good relationship, should come through. But I think, um, and I'm not having a go at Darren and Steve, but I, I think once it gets a bit Fletch and Macca, you know, mate, I, yeah, uh, huh, yeah I think it, you're kind of cutting the, it, you know, the audience weren't in the bar with you last night. They don't, you, I'm sorry, it, it's not, that's not why we're watching. We're not, we haven't turned on for you two, we've turned on for the game. So, yeah, should we talk about the game? Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's my feeling, uh, but it's very personal taste um, commentary. We, yeah, as Barry Davis fa famously said, one man's commentator is another man's pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I 100% I I understand that. Um, and in, in our part of the world, I've heard people refer to you as the voice of, of football, as you, you were very well versed in the, the Merseyside football scene during it, its golden era. Um, you enjoyed successful times during the 70s with Nottingham Forest under Brian Clough. Um, I believe it was 77 that you joined up with Radio City. Um, I know that lot, the other side of Stanley Park, won their first European Cup that year. But did you get, did you get the sense, especially from the blue side of things, that something special was emerging? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th this is the job I've always wanted to do. And I managed to stumble into a radio station uh, straight from uni uh, as a T-boy, really. And then, yeah, I, I, I kind of spent a year or so as a proper football reporter, commentator with Brian Clubs, Nottingham Forest, when they were a mid-table champion. Well, they were on the way up, funny enough. They got mm. promoted in 77. You know where their first game was in the top division? It was Everton and they beat us as well. It was they? at Everton and they absolutely killed Everton that day. They were brilliant. Uh, and of course, they won the title that year and they won the European title the next year. It was, it's an extraordinary story when you think about it. And that, and much as Liverpool fans hated Everton, well, I don't know how much they did hate Everton back then. I think it was a slightly friendlier derby in the late 70s than it is now. But there was a proper rivalry. Uh, within a year, they hated Nottingham Forest a lot more. Uh, so I arrived in the week of, um, well, Fairclough scored against San Etienne, but it was the second League Cup final against Villa at Old Trafford. Um, so um, yeah, Everton were in the midst of a League Cup final. Um, or was it the second one? In my, yeah, it was the second one. It went to three games, I think. Mm. I, I think that's right. But uh, Elton Wellesby was my boss. Uh, he he employed me. Who is a, uh, is a big Evertonian, um, but he was inevitably covering the Liverpool games at, in the last two months of that season. Uh, they were going for the treble. They won the league, lost the FA Cup final to a bit of a crazy Manchester United goal, and then recovered and went on beat Munch and Glad back in Rome. Um, I was around Everton really. I was around Belfield. I was around that Everton team to begin with. 
uh, Gordon Lee was in charge, who I loved. I mean, I, I, you probably won't find too many Evertonians who think as fondly of Gordon as I do. Uh, just the football man through and through, absolutely 24-7 lived football. Slightly uh, absent-minded and scatty, uh, but hugely committed. And actually, do you know that Everton team that I covered in my first 18 months, two years at Radio City was very, very nearly, uh, I wouldn't say a great team, but very nearly a, um, a, a you know, a, a title chasing team. Mm. There were some tremendous players. The, the back four were kind of hewn out of Merseyside, you know, Dave Jones and Terry Darricott, Mickey Lyons, mm -hmm. Mike Pedgick. Big George Wood was in goal. He used to put his contact lenses in before the game, which never quite, you know, reassuring for the players around him. But great character, Woody. Uh, but then proper players. Um, Andy King, Martin mm. Dobson, Bruce Rioch, uh, Dave Thomas, Bob Latchford, um, uh, Trevor Ross. And then Dunk, Duncan McKenzie was in the team. And then... You know, Gordon was always looking for something different. Jim Pearson played a lot, who I loved. And then Mickey Walsh came from Blackpool. He was a big, big friend of mine. Still is. Lives in Portugal. I see him when I go over to Porto. Um, a lot of those guys, and particularly the, the, you know, the guys that followed, uh, really good friends. And um, uh, it, it was it was a it was a good time to arrive and be around Everton, really, but because. I say Elton was taking a lot of the Liverpool games. He moved on within a year or so to Granada Telly, and I, yeah, I suppose I started then doing more Liverpool games. But um, uh, you know, certainly in the mid '80s, when it, when arguably they were the two best teams in Europe, um, all those guys, on both sides, are our friends, and and. I'm often asked, you know, oh, what's the biggest game I've ever done? And the World Cup semi-final, 28 million people 18 months ago, um, two years ago. Um, actually, I always think the biggest game I ever covered was the 1986 FA Cup final because not only was it a massive occasion, Everton really should have won the league that year. The, the, you know, they, they, they had the destiny and the title in their own hands all the way into the final week that the, um, didn't win at Oxford. Uh, mm. Gary Lineker had a million chances. And uh, that's when they lost the, you know, the control of the title. Um, and then the, the FA Cup final, which was a, a big deal in the mid 80s, but probably in many ways a bigger occasion than the Champions League final, um, was almost a, a mirror image of the season. They were one up and and... On top, Liverpool in, in disarray, you know, Grobelar and Beglin falling out. And, um, but what was so big about the game for me was that I knew everybody on the field. I mean, they're all mates, mm -hmm. everybody. <clears throat> and I actually went to the Everton, the, 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 the two teams back, back in the day would have a banquet in London after the match before travelling back to wherever they were to Merseyside the next day for the trophy parade. And um, I was... I was invited to both. Um, and I went I went with Gary Stevens to the Everton banquet. Um, I just kind of felt that, you know, I hadn't scored any goals. It was, it was nothing to, for me to celebrate with the Liverpool players. I honestly wasn't torn one way or the other. It's much easier to commiserate with your friends, I think. And so, um, yeah, I went to the Royal Gardner Hotel um, in Kensington and I sat on Gary's table that night. And um, yeah, drowned, drowned your sorrows with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Memories. Yeah, brilliant. I was, was going to say, you feature in Everton, Howard's Way, the brilliant film yeah. directed, directed by Rob Sloman, who, who's someone who I, I also have a yeah. tremendous amount of respect for. Um, I feel like film is a, a great way to mediate across to the new generation or the casual sports fan. Um, I've grown up obviously being told stories of that team and the club around that time, you know, best goalkeeper in the world, Peter Reid, nearly winning world player of the year. And I was wondering if I had no prior knowledge of the club, the, the side, how would you describe that team and the culture of the club around that time? 
Well, the culture of football was very different. And um, it's, not a, it's, it's not a secret that one of Howard's um, many managerial tools, great man, great manager, um, was if there was an issue, get everybody down to a Chinese restaurant um, in the middle of Sefton Park, I think it was, um, get a few glasses down them, um, and then everybody tell each other what they really thought of each other, clear the air, uh, uh, a few more drinks to forget what we just said, and, and on you go. Now, not only would the sports scientists <laughs> be taking suicide pills at the very thought of any of that going on, even the charged food probably they wouldn't care for, but of course in the selfie Twitter age, it would be a scandal, and rightly so, I guess, you know, that, that um, your players letting off steam in that way. Um, but that was the era. They were fit, you know, they were athletic. Um, I mean, Brace, uh, Paul Bracewell played half a season with a broken leg. Um, you know, they were... Um, the, the camaraderie between them, and obviously football is a more diverse world now and, and, and good for it. You know, I think it is great when, particularly when people come from far and wide, play for Everton and for Liverpool and make their homes here, you know, they're, they're, they're in Merseyside, that it, you know, it gets in their blood and that's, it, that's, the kids are born in Merseyside and, you know, they've got Scouse actions and stuff. Um, it, it, you know, that is, there is still a fellowship between teams, but not like the there was back then. And you'll see it with the um, the former players' associations on both sides of the park are really strong. And um, I, I couldn't come to the launch of, of Rob's um, movie, and not not partly because it was I had a game two nights later, and I knew that I'd have a hangover still two nights later if I came. So um, I didn't I didn't make the trip up to Merseyside, but nearly everybody did. They all came back together. I, I probably the last time I was with them all was sadly at Howard's funeral. Um, but it was just like all. Okay, I, I drove up from uh, John Clinkart, the uh, physio that some people remember looked like Magnum. Uh, I, he's actually my physio still. He, he only lives about uh, 15 miles away from me, and we drove up together. And <clears throat> it was it, it was almost like I was part of the team, you know, um, just seeing everybody. And she'd come over from America, and um, it is a, it's a fantastic bond. And a, and it, of course, it it kind of came out of adversity. There was that famous week when everything seemed to have hit rock bottom. And I think there were 9,000 inside Goodison for a League Cup tie. And um, uh, Andy Gray was signed, what? You know, some old croc. Um, Peter Reid um, was promoted into the first team, what? Some old croc. Um, Colin Harvey was promoted to uh, first team coach alongside Howard. Um, and it, it just turned from there, you know, I was there at Oxford the night that Inchi equalised, Kevin Brock, what, you know, the, the greatest Evertonian who never played for Everton. Uh, his back pass seized upon by Inchi, Um And on they went. And uh, the 84 FA Cup final, the breakthrough victory. Um, obviously, I was, you know, I covered all that. Um, arguably the most important victory in Everton's history because it was the breakthrough. Uh, what were the players talking about after the game? Elton John's suit. Couldn't believe Elton John's suit. You know, all these crazy little stories. Um, yeah, and then I was, yeah, travelled with them. I uh, got threatened in the loo of a hotel in Munich by Pat Van and Howe. Uh, yeah, everything. You name it. I, <laughs> I was kind of there. So, wow. um, the, the, but, but, spirit what would i tell you about them just out of adversity um and i don't know how close howard was to the set we'll never know um but um out of that adversity grew something together and they're mm. still together you go to goodison now i was i've been at games this season sharpie's there higgy's there uh, snods there they're still there together still mm. mates still still a team you know they're still a team max they still get together and um 
and that's that's what you know, forget forget the the booze and the Chinese meals. What makes them different? They their communion, their companionship. Most definitely, and as as you touch on there, like the and as I'm well aware myself uh, as a sports media soon to be graduate, the access for media personnel back then seemed just so much greater. Um, I'm sure being around someone as prestigious as Brian Clough give you a few shifts in how you conduct yourself or maybe even your work itself. Um, I know the likes of Howard and Colin Harvey are notorious for the, the high standards of which they set for the lads. And I was wondering, I, I know you, you mentioned there some of the stories that you've had, like, you know, being threatened in a loo by Psycho Pat. Like, did, did any major shifts occur uh, during your time of following Everton? Well, the big single change in my time in broadcasting, the 153 years I've been doing this, uh, is the breakdown in communication between football and its media, the breakdown in trust. And, and it's, it's sad because what's the function of the media? It is to be the, the middle men and women between the fans and the game, you know, but we, we, we're put in a privileged position to talk to the game, talk to the managers, talk to the players, and then we tell you, we tell that, tell the public, tell our listeners, our followers, our readers, and that somewhere that that you know that chain has been broken by so much mistrust, and I think both sides are probably as guilty. Um, I think that in the mid eighties, I mean, even though those guys were household names and faces, you probably still see Kevin Sheedy in Sainsbury's you know they they didn't live you know behind security gates and sort of some remote um estuary in the world or or in Presbury a lot of them don't even you know live in Merseyside now because it's kind of they feel it's sort of too claustrophobic perhaps to be close to the fans I understand that I mean it's it's just a different relationship now. They're still good guys. You know, they're not bad guys. They're not, it, that's not the issue. You know, and Tom Davis plays for Everton. He's a, you know, it is, it, it kiss the badge. You know, this this is my team. So um, it, it's just, I don't know, it's become poisoned. And I think, um, I, I don't think it'll, it, you know, that will ever be, um, that will ever be repaired. And yeah, as I say, it, when, when I, joined Radio City in 1977, we travelled on the team coach. We, we travelled with them. We, we stayed in the hotel um, and, and then travelled back with them in, you know, on the coach. Um, we were going to a European game. We flew with the players on, on the plane. They were, I say they were, they were my pals. It was pre-mobile phones and stuff. I had all the home numbers. I knew, you know, I knew their their wives would pick the phone up. Ah, yeah, yeah, you're going on your, on your, you know, you'd, you'd be, is Peter there? Yeah, or whatever. You could just get him, Barbara. Yeah, fine. Like, and all that stuff, you know. It was, um, and I say I was the same age as them, so mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a crime to go to the Conti on a Saturday night and and have a few scoops, and and I was there with them. So it was just a really, really different relationship. And of course, I got to know stuff. Um, which I shouldn't have done, and of course I didn't tell anybody. Um, you know, we, I I found out that Howard was going to Spain through. You remember? Well, you will remember him. Sadly, we lost him very recently. Michael Robinson played for Liverpool. Big pal lived close to me in the Wirral, and um, Robbo went to northern Spain in the January before Howard went, and he got wind of it. I think Howard had been talking to him about you know the possibility and what Bill Bauer was like and stuff and I was talking to Robbo when he was in Spain he was on his own out there before his family had moved out quite regularly on the phone and he told me and I went and I knocked on Howard's door and I uh, said look you know I'm sorry I've, I've been told you, you're leaving and, he's, and he looked at me and he, in fairness to Howard he was just fantastic he said don't make me lie to your son and that was sort of that was his kind of confirmation. And I went to Jim Greenwood, who's the old sort of second they call it the secretary. I mean, really, in that in that in, in the modern setup, he'd be chief executive or something. Uh, and I said, Look, 
I'm sitting on a big story here. I don't know what to do. And he said, oh, God. He said, please don't let it out. Um, and he said, I promise you, you'll, when we're ready, we'll give it to you first. And, and Howard was in on that. And I literally announced it on Radio City an hour before anybody else got it. But I sat on it for two weeks. Well, that, you wouldn't do that today. Mm. No, you, you wouldn't dare do that today. You, you, you know, the, the information goes out now before it's confirmed. It's, it, you know, it goes out in speculation. It goes out on Twitter or whatever. But back then, and I say, I mean, that, that, was, that was good journalism. That was how you kept your relationship. And when Howard came back, he was still a friend, you know? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I would 100% agree with it your sort of perspective on things in mm-hmm. that sense um you mentioned there that you you were on the whittle and i i always find it very interesting to to talk about to people about this who are there and to experience it at the time uh, especially with the film howard's way for someone of my age i'm 21 i found it really politically informative about the, the state of merseyside around that time obviously with the likes of the toxic riots uh, and the sort of the unrest at the time and as as an well, out- like, I was going to yeah, say as an, as an outsider, but someone who was you know getting to know the place and getting you know as you were saying developing so many different friendships. How did you find that aspect of things? Well, I I arrived um, on Merseyside in the spring of seventy seven, and I moved to London in the summer of ninety two. So I was a Wirral resident throughout that period, fifteen years, and I uh, was at Radio City for most of that time, and then on to Granada Television. So for Radio City, I not only covered extraordinary football matches, European finals, world club. I went to Tokyo twice with Liverpool for a world club final. But, you know, all these successes that we've talked about. um, I was at the Heisel Stadium. Um, I wasn't at Hillsborough. I was at the Everton semi that day, but I was heavily involved in the aftermath of of Hillsborough. I was um, requisitioned to report on a Margaret Thatcher um, general election win in Merseyside. I was requisitioned to report, I think, 18 months later on the local council, which, you know, Derek Hatton's, I mean, barely recognizable as the Labour Party of the truth told, won. A Toxteth riots, um, Shankly's death and funeral, uh, Len shooting. Um, just the most amazing period of time when I think it was kind of Merseyside against the world for a spell you know I I um for my sins I'm a remainer and I I I was at a I hate I hated the title people's vote but I, I kind of liked the idea of maybe a second referendum last year and I I went to host um a, a people's vote event in which Sir Michael Hesitine spoke and what a man by the way the most unlikely ambassador, I think, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that Thatcher sent him to Merseyside because she didn't trust and like him and thought that he might get eaten. <laughs> uh, and I think his job really was to try to saw um, through the land from like Runcorn round to Southport and cast cast this city off <laughs> into the Atlantic, if possible. And he did quite the opposite. He he was he became hugely loved and respected on Merseyside for taking Merseyside seriously and helping the regeneration of the city in the area and he's still you know welcome in the city to this day so uh, there were crazy times re- really crazy crazy times and um i i've often thought it, that it must have been great to have been your age on Merseyside in 1964, you know, that that suddenly the city's become the centre of the world. The two football teams are great, you know, they're mm. swapping titles just as they were in the mid 80s. Uh, but, you know, to, to, you know, to go on the Gladys Street by day and go to the cabin at night, I mean, it's kind of some kind of young fantasy there. Um, and and it, it really must have been wonderful. It uh, must have been a marvellous time to be on Merseyside. But uh, the, the, the spell that I spent there, um, you know, in terms particularly as a young kind of journalist, finding your way, sports journalists, finding your way, um, they, were, they were pretty exciting times. And, um, yeah, Pope, I remember the Pope, 
visit, I accommodated on the Pope, <laughs> uh, coming down Hope Street between the two cathedrals. Incredible, incredible events. And it, it all just seemed to, you know, gravitate around this, I mean, changing city. I think it's a different city again now. You know, I think um, the regeneration of, of, of I mean, clearly there are still economic problems uh, on Merseyside as there are in some of the big cities right now, there's a, a different kind of issue with the uh, the worries about the R rate and stuff. But um, it, I, I think it is a, a milder city now. I think it, it's hopefully a more prosperous city now. It certainly has that feel when you, when you drive down uh, the waterfront there. And um, yeah, I, I think um, back in the, the late 70s and early 80s it was a, a very militant city in many many ways and um i mean hillsborough kind of you know did that almost separated it from from the rest of the world all over again really um and and the you know the diverse initial reaction certainly to um to the tragedy in sheffield yeah definitely um i want to touch on that a little bit later on but mm -hmm. you mentioned there as as you know, as a, as a young journalist, um, that is obviously is something I find particularly interesting. You mentioned the, the commentary charts that you've been coming out with, and I think that's a fantastic way to, to stay creative during a, mm -hmm. during a time like this. You've obviously got your notes from that buying game, um, the semi-final second leg European Cup Winners' Cup, um, I, which many people regard uh, as our finest and most memorable night. And I was wondering, do you agree with that? Uh, atmosphere, yeah. Um, achievement, it would be, um, it would be, be pushing there. I mean, it, it weird. The final was almost a bit of an anticlimax, really, after that, um, just because of the emotion that was wrapped up in the comeback. You know, Bayern scored first that night. That people who don't remember, um, Everton got a, a really good result in Munich, and. Um, and I managed to get away from Big Pat. Uh, he was having a fag in the loo. <laughs> yeah, to, to this day, it made me promise never to tell anybody that he smoked. Um, I, I don't think it's a massive secret anymore, Pat, sorry. Um, but um, uh, that was all it was. He just held me against the wall for about five seconds and made me promise never to tell anybody that he smoked. But, um, uh, you know, they um, fell behind at, uh, at Goodison. And I think I think the, it's an Everton performance that's misrepresented to, to a degree. I think if you actually bother to look back at the highlights of the game, two things. It, it's been portrayed, you know, that the Bayern coach famously said that I don't know what they played, but it wasn't football. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the Belgian keeper, Jean-Marie Faf, kind of got hounded and scared. And it was almost like he was, you know, battered like you might be at Plough Lane, you know, if you went to play Wimbledon. It wasn't like that. Mm. Actually, Bayern were naughty in the first half. It was a really physical first half. And Bayern were, were probably started that. Uh, and Everton responded to it. It was a bit of a roughhouse first half. Everton conceded a soft goal on the counter. And, uh, yeah, they were up against it. Um, and the first, you know, if you only watch the goals, then the first two goals come from long throws. Um, yeah, Gary Stevens had this great long throw, and and yeah, it, you know, obviously Andy and Sharpie sort of got about the goalkeeper as you would. But if if you want a memory from that night, look at the third goal. Yeah, brilliant counter that, That's that's the football Everton played then. You know, I, as much as I've I talked before about the kind of communion and the spirit and Reedy and Brace playing with a broken leg and Andy getting stuck in and, you know, the FA Cup final goal against Watford. Again, look at the other goal. Because Everton were as much about Sheedy and Stephen and, you know, the, 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 and, and Inchi, the, the, you know, the cleverness, the balance, the grace. The, and, it, and what Howard created was a beautifully balanced team with a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, probably the finest goalkeeper in the world at the time. Um, and but but the, the team thing in many ways, I'm, and I'm not calling Links for this, but because I mean Links scored 100 goals that say whatever he scored that season, he did his bit. 
but in a funny sort of way, Everson weren't as good w w with him because he, he isn't, as, he just isn't as much of a team player. He isn't. I mean, that, that part of his greatness as an, as an England and as a, a, a you know, who, the teams he played for, Tottenham and Leicester and stuff. Um, he is a poacher. And he, he, it was his kind of single minded selfishness which made him so effective as a player. But it, 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 it didn't feel quite the same with, mm. with him in the team as it did with Inchi. And that togetherness, that where they come from together, the appreciation of what Sheeds could do, appreciation of what Trev could do. Um, they, they, they were, a, be they were a team of, of, for all seasons, really. They could win games in all kinds of way. And um, people who were around at the time, would re they'd remember a five-goal win over Manchester United one Christmas. Boy, they were good that day. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and just going to Anfield and playing, you know, not not just not just winning, but but taking on that Liverpool team on their own turf and playing, playing confidently. Um, no, they they were they were a really, really good team. And obviously it it is um I don't use tragedy and disaster because they're they're you know, that they belong in a dip, in a different sphere. But it is a great, great shame that they never got to play in the European Cup. Yeah, and before just pushing on to that, I was wondering, you know, you mentioned a few there, like the 5-0 win against United, uh, doing the double over Liverpool that year too. Uh, are there any other memorable performances that, that spring to mind? Because as you say, such beautiful and, and intricate players like Kevin Sheedy, Trevor Stephen. Yeah, I think you remember, the, inevitably remember the occasions that, um, you know, those dramatic semi-finals um, that, I, they were lucky against Luton, if the truth is told. Mm. They didn't play very well that day. I think they were getting a bit weary. I think there were a lot of fixtures. It was round about the time of the buying game, wasn't it? Um, and uh, it, they were the matches were coming one after another. And if you look at the um, the appearances, it was pretty much the same team that Howard was putting out every every well twice a week. Um, so they were a bit lucky against um, Luton, but. And I, I was going to say there's sheets for you, although it was a rotten free kick. I don't know how it went in. But then Derek, you know, how many goals did Derek Manfield score? Uh, yeah. The delivery from Sheets was fantastic. I remember that the semi-final at Highbury. I remember being in the dress room after the game, uh, getting in there and, in, and interviewing uh, Inchi. And um, yeah, I mean, they, they were special occasions, special, special days. Um, it, the 87 title win was special in a different way. It was They ground that out a bit. Um, Wayne Clark came at the end and scored some really important goals. Um, you know, the, the team was changing. Um, uh, but it, it, and it wasn't as an expressive a side then. Uh, Dave Watson was a very good player for Everton. You know, he'd come into the team really important. He gave a little bit more of that character back, you know, which which the likes of Peter and Andy Gray are, are sort of brought um, very, very good servant of Everton Football Club. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, it, it, the, the team took on a little bit of a different character and a different face, and we moved forward then towards um, when I caught up with Everton again, really, which was with Big Joe, who is one of my very, very favourite people in football. Mm. Love his company. Fantastic man. and. Um, I was the uh, I was the BBC reporter in the Cup Final Hotel in '95, which mm -hmm. um, was a fantastic experience. Uh, it was such a big deal then the FA Cup Final on telly, and um, I, I eventually got to commentate on some, which was kind of the dream, really, of a young commentator. But um, being the reporter in the hotel was an incredible pressure on you to come up with the stuff, you know. And uh, I thought I was going to have a fantastic I, I thought I'd landed perfectly, you know, because Joe was such a good friend. And there were still guys that I knew from the old days in the team, Neville in particular. Um, but uh, it was um, Sopwell House, I think it was called, up in Hertfordshire. And I was there to meet them on the Thursday. And, and the big deal, really, for the cup final reporter is to get the team. What's the team going to be? Because when cup final grandstand comes on the air and Des Lynham's there, 
they have the first thing they do is hand to the two team hotels before they maybe see them getting on the coach a little bit later on but first thing is and of course there was a big question mark over the Everton team for, for that final because Dunk was you know weren't sure whether he was going to be fit or not and um I arrived there on the Thursday as they as they arrived on Thursday night and Joe greeted me with a big grin and I thought I was going to get a big bear hug from him and he just immediately said you're not getting our team by the way he said don't think because you're my mate you're going to get the team and I, I thought oh okay because he's you know quite apart from anything else he's smart is Joe Royal and he knew what he knew what my task was um but I got it <laughs> I got it and uh, I didn't I didn't um I, I didn't have the confidence to say definitively but I hinted at the lunchtime and then I was in the uh, tunnel after the game and uh, uh, I'd done a couple of interviews on the pitch and, and then down the old Wembley tunnel, I was waiting outside the dressing room. I know what it was, we'd, we'd asked for permission to take the cameras into the dressing room and um, the players were happy with it, but we had to get Joe's nod and I hadn't seen Joe after the game. Somebody else had interviewed him and uh, he came walking down the tunnel uh, and I had this big smile on my face and he had a big smile on his face. And I thought he was going to give me a big hug, you know, what just beat Manchester United in the cup final underdogs. And he pinned me to the wall and he said, who told you my fucking team? He still <laughs> remembered like five hours later, you know, his team's won the FA Cup and he's still, and I said, can we go to the dresser? He said, yeah, go on. <laughs> so I can't tell you. He says, I know you can't tell me. <laughs> uh, that's really I've just written a book funny enough it's out next spring and Joe that's when you'll find out who told me the team <laughs> <laughs> brilliant brilliant I was, I was going to say like, you, you covered the bulk of it there basically is saying you know the, the tragedy of Hazel happens and so many changes occur like uh, we should have done that double in, in 86 get it back in 80 get the league back yeah. in 87 we're effectively dragged through the mud for the most of the 90s until as you say Big Joe's dogs of war come along uh, and <laughs> did, did you get the sense as you say you were reporters in the hotel did you get that sense that an upset would be on the cards i think they were a good underdog because of the dogs of war um which i think was joe's phrase wasn't it i mean it wasn't like they were christened the dogs of war by the daily mirror or anything that i think it was joe's own phrase um i mean they're great guys barry horn's such a good guy Mm. and Joe and, and John Everill who's you know still around and uh, I mean John Everill wasn't a dog of war anyway he was a bit he was a bit, he was a bit better than that um, so um, I, I don't know I mean I was in that camp I, I, I was in the United camp I was in the United team hotel following year um, was that the they beat, it was the Cantona final the following year, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, I was in the, yeah, I was in the Chelsea team hotel in 94 when Manchester United battered them. And then I was 96, I was in the Manchester United team hotel when um, uh, they beat Liverpool, Cantona's goal. So, uh, I don't know, I'd say the FA Cup final was such a big deal then. And it, where, and surprises were, you know, were, were not uncommon on cup final day. Um, you know, Wimbledon and Southampton and Sunderland and all that kind of through the 70s and into the 80s. Um, yeah, I, mean, I guess the I guess the Wimbledon beating Liverpool was the last great shock until Wigan beat Manchester City, but it, it was a, so certainly a surprise. It was a decent Everton team, you know. Um, it wasn't like they were a mid table second division side or anything, but um, yeah, I mean, that the United were expected to win on the day. Mm, and yeah, it, it was a great triumph and one I'm, I'm yet to see us repeat. You know, uh, that's the one thing I long for is just to see us pick up a, a piece of silverware. But more hard yeah. days with more hard days were to come. You know, like the the great escape in '98 against Wimbledon, and, and I was born in '98, so I'm alive now. Uh, <laughs> although I was young, I was I was still very much immersed in football. And one of the very first players I think I got on the back of a shirt was a certain Wayne Rooney. Um, he's made a couple of appearances until we come up against Arsenal, uh, a side that haven't lost the game of football in a year, I believe. Uh, substituted on in the last 10 minutes, he takes a tremendous first touch, 
turns and you know the rest is history you deliver arguably one of the most iconic pieces of of commentary <laughs> in my lifetime. Luckiest. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember of the whole Wayne Rooney phenomenon around that time? Well, I've told the story. I've told the story a few times, and it's a great story, uh, and it's also in the book. Um, I, I'd, I'd been at a, an Alec Young testimonial function at Goodison Park about six months earlier. Um, it, they gave Alec a, a game and a couple of dinners and stuff. Um, sort of late in his life, really, and um, I, I must have been MC or something. I've you know been asked to do a charity and you know, support Alec and stuff. And they're fine. Um, and a guy came up to me. I, I still to this day don't know his name, but I can see him. A huge guy, um, six feet four, and big pointed beard, and um, smiley face. And uh, he came up, and as people do, and he said. Uh, uh, I just got one thing to say to you, Clive. Wayne Rooney, remember the name. And I was aware of Wayne because he'd scored a bag full of goals for Merseyside Boys and your local radio. We were always across all of that stuff. And uh, of course, the Youth Cup run the previous season. And he'd actually been on the bench, I think, for a first team game towards the end of the previous season. As you say, it wasn't his debut, you know. I mean, he, he, he'd been around the first team squad and stuff, and um, we'd seen him. But he was still 16 years of age, and um, uh, I was doing the game for the Premiership. It was in the days when ITV had match of the day, tactics truck, and all that stuff. And um, yeah, I, I hadn't made a note on my chart or anything, um, but I, I was aware that he would become the youngest Premiership scorer, Premier League scorer, if he scored. So I had some notes for that. Obviously, Arsenal had been on this fantastic unbeaten run. Um, and on he came. And um, I think um, in, in terms of sort of the anatomy of a whole commentary, and there's no such thing as a, a, a menu or anything that you follow, but you prepare for the event if it happens and the significance and status of the event. But if the goal is as special as it was, then I think you go with the, I think if I'm trying to teach somebody to be a commentator, forget all that for now, put that to one side, we'll come to that, you know, what it means, you go with the goal. And it was, I think, as it flew in, I just said, great goal, brilliant goal, something like that. And the, that that's it. But then I got this camera shot, we're, we're on the uh, opposite the main stand there, where the cameras are at Goodison. And he ran away towards the main stand. And I can see it now, the number 18 on his back, Rooney. And uh, I guess this whisper in my ear just came in, into, my, into my head. And um, thankfully, uh, he, he turned out to be a really, really good player. I mean, that, if that had been all he'd ever done in his career, then it would have sounded a bit stupid, um, played over and over again. <laughs> um, and there's there's two lovely postscripts to it. Um, firstly, that having come out with what I, I mean, I'm vain enough to say was a decent piece of commentary. I covered everything in it. It's Premier League history, what, et cetera, et cetera. Just come of age or something like that. You know, all the cliches came out. And damn me, he nearly scored an even better goal two minutes know. later, which would totally spoil it for me because I was I was out of words by then. You know, so thankfully that didn't go in. Um, and then about six months later, I was at another testimonial function at Goodison. And I look across the room and there he is, my my chief scout. <laughs> and he's smiling away and I'm fighting my way through the crowd to go over and sort of thank him. And he said to me, I've got two more for you. I said, oh, wow, this is unbelievable. He said, Wayne's brother, John, is going to be even better. <laughs> I said, all right, yeah, okay. John was 12 at the time, okay. Uh, he said, but, he said, is it, was it John Paul Kissick? Yeah, he yeah, said, yeah. He's going to be better. Now, he should have stuck with Wayne, really, because both John Paul and John actually have had decent careers, professional careers, but they're not, not yeah. quite as good as Wayne, are they? Not Wayne, really. Yeah, so I know. My, my mystery man 
uh, rather let himself down eventually. Unfortunately, I never got the chance to call either a John Rooney or a John Paul Kissett girl. Otherwise, I might have, I might have gone with him and said, this guy's going to be even better than Rooney's. But fortunately, that never happened to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wayne Rooney, I, I find it very interesting. Like, obviously, as a young lad, it absolutely broke my heart when he went to Manchester United. And, you know, in terms of the media's eyes being on a footballer, there are a few finer examples of the, the scrutiny that he's been under ever since. And I'd be, well, I'd be fascinated to get your take on things. And my opinion is I think he's the finest Englishman to ever kick a football. Uh, would you say so? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, here's a name drop for you. I played golf yesterday with Glenn Hoddle, who's a very, very good man and a really good friend. And it was great to see him, although he needs a haircut. Um, in terms of natural talent, two-footed, I mean, absolutely up there with anything. I mean, it's often said if he'd been Brazilian, he'd had a hundred caps, you know, and, and there was kind of an, an era in English football where we were 4-4-2 and we had Brian Robson and Ray Wilkins and whatever, whatever. Uh, Reedy, actually, I mean, w was part of all of that. And Glenn kind of, a little bit like Paul Scholes a little bit later, well, we need to get him in the team. We'll play him wide left. <laughs> yeah, OK, whatever. I, I'm not quite sure how he's supposed to influence the game from there. So we, we almost had a suspicion of skillful players, weirdly. And, and the, there is a bit of um, a kind of a label that comes with a skillful player that they don't care as much. And, you know, Chiefs and Indians, you've got to have a belt. Wayne was a skillful player who really, really cared. And... Um, yeah, partly where he comes from. I mean, uh, you know, he, he is a scouser and he's still a scouser. And you can't, you know, you can take the lad out of Liverpool, but th that is Wayne. And and I think he lived his life. I think, I don't think he'll have any regrets in his career. I think, and it's not really for me to say, but I, I, I think probably Sir Alec Ferguson always wondered about his professionalism at the very highest level you know the way that Ryan Giggs squeezed another five years out of his career just by being a great pro by being doing the yoga and and un, you know always being bang on the right weight fighting weight and everything mm. um and you know there's kind of always probably a feeling that Wayne didn't quite have that 20th 21st century level of dedication that that some people have um, I, if if that's the case, and if that's the case, and I'm not saying it is, then I th I think he'd probably be quite happy with what you know. He, I mean, he, he went to Manchester United and broke goal scoring records. Yeah. He'd broken an England goal scoring record. I mean, that's that's the status of his career. Okay, he not won anything with England, but he, he won a lot with Manchester United. A lot. Mm. And and never obviously lost that feeling for Everton. So that when it was improbable, I mean, crazy. If he'd said halfway through his United career, or go back, go yeah, yeah, fine, whatever. But he wanted to. That's Wayne. That's his. It's it's that's his heart. That's that's where his heart is and was. And mm. and I think I I, I really think that in another 10 years time, Evertonians would look upon him as, you know, Howard didn't have to come back. And it, you could argue it was a mistake for him to come back again, certainly. But that's, you, you've got to respect that in people when they're prepared to come back and, and have another go mm. because they love the club and love, love everything to do with it. And um, I've, got, I, I've got a lot of time for him. I really have. I've got a lot of time for him. And yeah, I think he was a was a hugely gifted footballer, probably still is at the level he's playing. Um and um but he's an Evertonian. He is yeah. an Evertonian. You can't there's no denying that. You know, when some people kiss the badge and you think, yeah, you'll be you'll be off to Milan next year. But when if Wayne kisses that badge, you know. Um, nothing but the best is good enough. That's that's the badge that he really cares about. Mm, I know it's like the the Alan Ball quote: "Once Everton has touched it, nothing's quite the same again." Um, mm. But I, I was I was curious as well because, like, obviously, yeah, you raised the the issues about 
has as I say, I hesitate to call it like a regression as he moves later in his career into the midfield and what have you. But like in terms of a young player bursting onto the scene, I think the only sort of comparisons are like the Achille and Mbappe at the moment. Like Messi has always been surrounded by elite talent. Uh, Ronaldo obviously came over to, to Manchester United very young, but to, to, to break through it as Wayne did uh, as a young lad in that team, you know, just elite, uh, elite young talent. Yeah, I mean, you you won't thank me for making comparisons with Liverpool like your mate did earlier. But if you're talking about great Liverpool players, and obviously I get asked a lot about that. There were, I think, great Snowball used word, but there were about five or six of them who kind of played together. And then there was Stevie Gerrard who played with nobody that was great. Mm. You know, Carrie's a good player, but he's a really, 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 really good player. But And, and Xavi Alonso is really, really, but not great. Stevie, Stevie played as the only great in that team. And, and you're right. I think it is, it, it, you know, when you are not quite, you know, it's not a one-man team, but particularly at that age, to be so outstandingly better than really anybody around you, you know, it was Thomas Gravison who played the ball through to him. Uh, let's, you know, let's face it, he's a skillful player and everything. But that's, they were the players that he was playing with. And um, I think without, I, what I don't want to do is, is kind of stereotype Merseysiders by any means, there are all kinds of Merseysiders, there are all kinds of Glaswegians in every city in the world. But when you grow up and you're good at something and everybody's having a bit of a bite at you, you're probably playing above your age limit. So you're pretty, you have to be pretty tough physically and mentally to get by in a big city when you've got a bit of talent. And, um, he was, uh, there's an old phrase on Blue Peter, one we made earlier. And I think, you know, that's what Wayne was. He, it, you know, was he nervous about making his debut at 16? No, he'd seen worse things on the way home from school. You know, it, 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 he'd lived a bit. He was a 16 year old who'd lived a bit. And, um, and that's, that's why, I mean, we're getting it in, with South London players at the moment. They're coming out of South London ready to go they're ready to go at 17 18 why because their life's tough you mm. know their life's been tough on those estates and uh and it, it you know, the the two things don't have to go together but i remember you know when, when my son was playing football 12 13 14 <clears throat> and uh you know, they'd play for his Sunday team and there'd be a Southampton scout there and he'd have a word with three or four of the parents afterwards. And they used to say to me, what do you think? Do you think he's good enough? And I <clears throat> I would never want to pop the dream. I'd say, we're middle class. You know, we, 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 we haven't, <clears throat> we haven't <clears throat> put these kids in education and stuff to become footballers. I mean, he's really, really good, your son, but does he want it as much as the kid from... Wandsworth, yeah, I'm just preparing you for the fact that he's now going to go for a trial at Southampton. Um, and they're going to be kids from, you know, back streets of Portsmouth and back streets of sort of wherever. And he's, they, they're going to want it a bit more. Wayne wanted it. Wayne was good enough, but he wanted it. He mm. really, really wanted it. Yeah. Bring it um, on. Yeah, 100%. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, he's come back and i found these last few years really, really peculiar uh, as an Evertonian, as under David Moyes, we were, you know, we could be archetyped as, you know, the epitome of stability. Uh, you know, what Moyes built, he deserves huge credit for. Um, and it's almost as if we've reached the summit of that when Roberto Martin has come in and, you know, we started playing that fantastic, you know, forward thinking football with the likes of Romelu Lukaku, Ross Barkley, John Stones, like really great stuff. Uh, I would argue it was a, a wrong decision of the club to let them all go almost simultaneously. But now, you know, we're, we're sort of in a position now where we've got a really prestigious manager in, in Carlo Ancelotti. What, uh, what do you make of Everton at the minute and, and the direction that we seem to be going in? Been a few false dawns, haven't there? Um, you know, there was a period three or four years ago. I, listen, I've seen less of Everton in that, that period than I have probably, um, you know, in the previous 40 or 30, year, 30 odd years. So uh, I'm not an expert on the subject. But 
there have been a couple of times when Everton had the best crop of young players in the country, unquote. You know, they've got three or four here now who are really, you know, Kenny and um, Davis. And, uh, and for one reason or another, it hasn't quite happened. Um, and I, it's not for me to say why. I remember doing a European game at Goodison. I'm pretty certain that Roberto was in charge. And um, they were getting pressed by an opposing side and still trying to play through. And, and basically the crowd w weren't having it. Uh, and and in, in the end, I think the players kind of looked to the crowd, looked to the bench, where probably Roberto was saying, yeah, yeah, keep playing. And they were looking, <laughs> they were looking behind them as they get it forward. And they start getting it forward and they had some success. Um, it's it's fine having a project and having a philosophy if you've got the players to carry it out. Um, Moisey was a yeah a, a more practical kind of manager, but then I think what has happened in in and and where perhaps somewhere somebody will reflect on Everton were one of the big six. Let's not forget that you know when particularly when the Premier League came into into being. It, it, Everton were one of the, the drivers of that. They were perceived to be one of the big six clubs in the country. Um, things have changed a little bit in the last 12, 18 months, but we've had a period of about a decade where we kind of knew who the big six were and the rest were playing for seventh, pretty much, you know? Yeah. Um, anybody certainly broke into that. And the Leicester City title season remains one of the most remarkable sporting things I've ever seen in my life. I have no idea how that's happened um, because it's, it is just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, but it, Everton somehow got left behind there. And um, you look at the stadium, I love it, but it's, it's not a 21st century stadium. Um, you look at Bill, I love him. But he's not a 21st century, and and you know things now changed. Um, he tried, he tried very hard to sell the club to the right person, and I think because he loved the club so much, he was, you know, there was never going to be a Hicks and Gillette, 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 or whatever he was called, moment for Everton because Bill wouldn't let that happen, and you know, good on him for that. Um, you know, Liverpool kind of got away with that. Uh, that that era in their life, and United had them too, and might still have them. I don't know. Um, City got great owners. It it it, it can and it, it can go either way in that in those situations. We could all name clubs that have gone the wrong way under mm -hmm. new ownership, maybe West Ham or whatever. But um, it it just stood still somehow, um, and maybe the new stadium. In, and there's certainly some money in, around at the moment. Maybe I, I, I like Carlo Ancelotti very much. Um, I, yeah, but I, you don't want maybes and perhaps some guests on Everton podcasts. You, you've had too many of those. <sighs> you tell me. You, yeah. you, you want, you know, you want John Joe Kenny to be the Everton right. Well, well, actually, I mean, you, you know, right back hasn't been a massive issue with Seamus, but but, but you want. You want some of these guys to come through and claim. You want Tom Davis to play every week, or, or be good enough to be playing mm. every week. Um, so you haven't you haven't quite got that at the moment, and you haven't got that continuity as a result. So you need some stability, and you need some progress. And I, there's certainly never been a better time for those that have got left behind to break back into the top six. And I, and I think that this season has been a big disappointment in that sense, because I think there was a feeling at the start of the season that Liverpool and Manchester City were so far ahead of the rest. Chelsea were handicapped by circumstances and the other three all had problems of one kind or another. Um, and those those problems have been very apparent and Arsenal, Manchester United and Tottenham have all been weaker this season. There have been signs of, of, of them starting to recover now and um, Chelsea look like they're going to spend big. I'm sure Manchester United will. Um, it's now or never. Well, not now or never, but it's it's now or maybe not in the next five years for Everton to get up there with Leicester City and I mean, cracky, you know, Wolves. Um, there's no. The, the, you can see why Everton might be left behind by the super rich clubs, but they shouldn't be getting left behind by Wolves and Leicester City. No, one hundred percent, and and fingers crossed. 
that you know when the the move to Bromley Moor Dock comes along, that's when we can sort of catapult ourselves amongst to you know get back amongst the big six uh, and look to be challenging for honours uh, and European places. It's funny. I was I was at Big Dunk's first game, and it was just like <laughs> it was just like it was nineteen eighty five, really. Yeah. Uh, and I actually said on the way out, there were a couple of people with big smiles. I saw Sharpie at the front door, and it, there was a real kind of oh, that's that's what we want. And I said, mm, yeah, it's worked today, <laughs> but I'm not sure that you can do that every week. You can't mm. be running up and down the touchline picking up ball boys. Uh, you, that's not that's not a future, you know. That's uh, and I, I, I'm kind of glad that he didn't get the job, really, because in the, the you can't just roll the clock back to 1985 and do that every week. Players 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 have been knackered by March. You know that you can't give that as much as they gave in that day. Um, and uh, so yeah, uh, we'll see. I mean, I. I I, I, I saw them at Manchester City um, not long before the break. Was it sort of Christmas, New Year? Yeah, they were knackered. And they, they, knackered. Looked, they, were knackered handcuffed. they yeah. looked handcuffed by the tactics. I mean, the the two boys up front who were two of the real pluses just looked as, as if they were looking at Carlo or was looking at Duncan saying, just tell Carlo to sit down. Can we have a go? Can we just pop it forward and go and fight for some balls because I think City played a back three and it was re- it was became a really strategic game. Well, there's only going to be one winner in that game. So it's difficult. It's difficult to get the right balance and, uh, and it's difficult to come into a club and say, look, you've got to go my way in any year. Honestly, this will be better because football isn't like that. You want it today. Um, and I think Everton today or, you know, week on whenever, Probably could go and play two up and get it up to the to Calvert Lewin and the big Brazilian boy and let's let's have a go. But it it isn't the future. You can't you can't do that every, every week. It's got to you know there's, there's got to be more to it than that. So yeah. let's see what he builds. You know it's it's it, it what, you've kind of got how many games left now? They're, they're kind of free games, aren't they? Really now to try and find something for next season. Yeah, as usual, nothing to play for. But yeah, as you say, you you can't really live off nostalgia and fingers crossed the the, the future's got. You don't want to be playing for. Wimbledon in the last game with something to play for, do you? You really oh, don't want that. <laughs> you're telling me, and, and fingers crossed, you won't be subject to any obstructive views when you when you get down to Bramley Moor Dock. No, I think uh, I'll miss built. it, but yeah, I'll miss the old place, but. <laughs> nice, and just to round off now. I mean, I'm waiting on my. Uh, my bachelor's degree in in, in right. sport in sports media, and when I was a baby faced eighteen year old, I really had my heart set on being a, a commentator or a broadcaster or something of, of that. Like I could spend all day asking you about the sort of in, intricacies of what it's like working to the BBC compared to ITV or radio compared to television. But if you could give yourself at twenty two, twenty one, if you were coming up today, what advice would you give yourself? Well, it's very different then, um, you know, uh, getting into uh, what is my dream job was about knocking on doors, really. Um, now it's more about getting the right education and, the, and you're, you're certainly on the right lines. Um, I I don't want to use the, re- the phrase oven ready because the man who I despise more than any in the country uses it. But um, you, you will come out kind of ready to go. You, you know, you'll be properly trained. You'll, you'll know your way around the studio. You'll know your way around um, in, um, publishing and stuff. So, uh, and that's very important. So um, I think it's, I, get, I still get mail from people who have not gone through um, further education and a media degree asking how to get in. I think it's really, really tough now for them because there are so many graduates and so few jobs. So inevitably employers are going to look to people who've, who've given the, the last three or four or five years of their young lives to, to try and learn the, uh, the ropes. So how do you make yourself different from all the other graduates? That's, that's what you've got to ask yourself. You've got to bring yourself to the party. You can, uh, read and listen to and watch people that you admire in in the business 
um, but don't copy them. Um, take take what you think is good about what they do. Hopefully, you'll be specifically analytical and critical to see things which are not so good, which you don't want. So, um, you know, put together a kind of an identikit of what you think is a good broadcaster or a good journalist, but then add your, add your own twist to that. Um, as I always say to media undergraduates, should, you should be consuming media differently from anybody else on the campus because this is a vacation. You know, you should have a view on every news bulletin, every football commentary, every blog that you read. You, you, you know, you should be looking at it as a reviewer and, and, and try to, to find your style and then you know, hone, hone your style and go forward. Be proactive, volunteer, um, CVs are everything. Um, you know, get experience. Um, you, you won't get paid for a lot of it. That's the, the way of the world, but it, it is currency. It is worth having. Um, it not only helps your experience, but it, it impresses potential employers. Um, and then just stay across the change. The, the media is changing by the day. Um, so stay across what's happening. I mean, the whole television football model, I think, is about to change. Um, you know, we've, we've been locked into a kind of subscription model now since 1992, since Sky came on the scene. I don't think millennials like buying anything. <laughs> I think they usually find a way to get it for nothing. Uh, I think they consume it in smaller bites. Um, I think they're more selective, smarter. I, you know, I think things like Now TV, they've had a really good first year. I think that's, I don't think we'll pay monthly annual subscriptions so much in the future. I think we'll buy stuff that we want to watch and see. Um, you know, a little bit like shopping for music is. Um, so, yeah, and, um, you know, streaming is, is um, you know, here. Um, it's just as pirating is here. Um, yeah, just be across it all. Uh, make sure you are 2021, you know, and ready to go in 2021 and, 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 and serving your audience is everything that we do. That's communication, knowing what your audience wants and giving them exactly that. Wise words, Clive. Thanks very much for your time. And I'll be looking to get a copy of those, uh, those notes again for that game against Bayern Munich. Yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah, uh, commentarycharts.com, enjoy. Brilliant.